and we were coming off our biggest months ever as just a team, myself and Ryan. Um, decided to open a real estate brokerage. We went the franchise route just because I wanted plug and play. I wanted everything pretty much set up and done for me. I didn't want to have to reinvent the wheel um, because that would have delayed the momentum um, and, and almost it would have stopped it if we would have had to just completely pivot and build the business from the ground up. Um, so we wanted to keep as much momentum moving forward going into a new company um, and a rebranding. So we went that route and then 2021, um, we started bringing on our first couple agents and um, we're the fastest growing brokerage in Kansas City. All right, what's up everybody? It is episode 42 of Yellow Colored Glasses and we have some awesome guests on today. And we're gonna start out reading a review from Kelsey M. She says that the Warren and Mounts Agency has been so great with helping us make sure that we're saving as much as we can while making sure we have the best coverage possible, especially with our life insurance. You definitely won't be disappointed working with anyone within this office. They're all great people. So, thank you, Kelsey. There we go, that was the wrong one. There we go, we got the clapping. Those are now, all good, yeah. So reviews, guys, um, thank you for leaving those. They mean a ton to us. They help us out a lot. We're, what are we at, 110, 120 now? Mm -hmm. So we're getting up there, yep. all right? Took a little bit, but now we're getting there. So. Anyway, I want to introduce you guys to our guest today. We have David Casey and Ryan Kelly from First Class Real Estate, yep. right here local in the Kansas City area and really all over the place too, right? So, That's right. Yeah, so, welcome guys. We're excited to have you th guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, super pumped to talk today. Yeah. It is going to be fun. They have a lot going on, um, both family guys, both owning their own business. Um, and We actually have a partnership with them as yeah, well. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Um, well, yeah. you, that's the main reason we have a partnership because you guys provide such great service. And like from what we've seen social media wise and us getting to know each other, it's just like a perfect match. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so speaking of you know social media and getting to know each other, <clears throat> it's been how long have we been talking? Like when did we first start? Last, Last year, year? Yeah, beginning, mm -hmm. middle of the year. Yeah. So about a year ago. So we get a lot of compliments on our social media, mm -hmm. and these guys do it just as good, if not better, with, mm -hmm. as at, like from a consistency standpoint. They're everywhere, right? Like yeah. every day I'm seeing them do shout outs with their agents, with mm -hmm. themselves, with all the stuff they got going on. So they do a phenomenal job. You guys need to check them out. Um, it was kind of funny how we, like I remember Dusty came up to me and he was like, dude, we need to talk to these guys. Um, he's like, these guys are on doing the exact same thing. Because mm -hmm. do you guys, did you guys know each other? No, no. no. Mm -mm. I didn't think so. But we're all like the same age. Too. I know. I mean, we're we all had very sim. And then when we had lunch together, right? It mm -hmm. was like okay, like mm -hmm. these guys are really just very similar to us. We're in a parallel universes, yeah. like doing the same thing, just different. <laughs> literally, literally Literally jobs. converging. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Because you guys went to school together, mm -hmm. business partners. I mean, Dusty went. I mean, it was so. It was kind of funny how all that came about. And then I remember Dusty was like, "Dude, we need to talk to these guys." Like I, he's I like, "I don't know them, but they're doing the same stuff we're doing." With the marketing you talked about, where you see us everywhere, like we mm -hmm. kind of have a philosophy. It's like um, everything is marketing, and marketing over everything. Right, so yeah. M O E is something we preach, and um, you, like we think of things in like a multiplier factor. So, mm -hmm. like if I can bring on ten agents at my office and I can get them all to promote a listing, then that just went out ten times of right. what I could do personally. And so, based on the leverage point of um, how many people they have following them, the reputation stuff that'll mm -hmm. all determine. But um, at the end sense. of the day, yeah. dude, it's like how big can you grow your following? And just like the reviews you were sharing today, like. You get more people involved, you build a community, um, it makes marketing easy. But we have to lead from the front and you know be a, a good role model of like what to push out, how to push out. So, um, But as we grow, it takes a little less effort on our end um, because everybody's just kind of ingrained in our culture now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, I think another point too is when you're talking about that MOE, we don't get introduced to you guys if you guys aren't doing what you're doing, right? If you're yeah. not out there you know, putting yourselves, you know, with the, with the Instagram, with the Facebook, all the things that you're doing. So yep. talk a little bit, you, you just brought up agents. Let's give the people a rundown of what your guys' business is, what your model is, um, and really kind of how it got started and all that stuff. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, we launched First Class Real Estate KC, uh, the tail end of 2020. Um, and we were coming off our biggest months ever as just a team, myself and Ryan. Um, decided to open a real estate brokerage. We went the franchise route just because I wanted plug and play. I wanted everything pretty much set up and done for me. I didn't mm -hmm. want to have to reinvent the wheel um, because that would have delayed the momentum 
Um, and, and almost it would have stopped it if we would have had to just completely pivot and build the business from the ground up. Um, so we wanted to keep as much momentum moving forward going into a new company um, and a rebranding. So we went that route. And then 2021, um, we started bringing on our first couple agents and um, we're the fastest growing brokerage in Kansas City. And we're, we've been able to maintain that and we're growing at a pretty decent clip month over month. Uh, right now we're at about 140 agents. That's um, awesome. And we've been just on- hit 100 transactions this month. That's yep. awesome. So we're closing uh, yeah, <laughs> about 100 deals a month um, and we're so right around cool. 140 agents. So it's and been a wild two years. Where were you guys at last year when we first started talking? Because I don't, it was not, I think you guys were like, what, 40, 50 transactions? 50, yeah, 55 um, agents, and we closed 340 transactions all of last okay. year. And this year, we're going to close over 1,500. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. it just comes back. It's like, um, what's your leverage point in business? And then, you know, are you, are you feeding that? Like, it's, you just got to know, like, um, small decisions like could make all the difference like it's the little details of okay what am i going to focus on today what am i going to do this and we always say like small hinges swing big doors swing big doors i literally saw that so, just the other day i mean we used to bust ass and work so hard just to sell like five or ten homes a month um and it would take every bit of our you know 24 hours a day seven days a week to get that done yeah but since we've grown a team and we built out systems and processes it's like that stuff's happening without even us moving a finger mm-hmm. um I think one of the biggest things early on that we learned that our mentor taught us was people move the money. So the more people that you're surrounded with inside of your community, the more leverage points you have to do other things such as starting an insurance company with Mm -hmm. you guys. Um, But if we hadn't had the people around um, and brought the people on, then that would have never been possible. Yeah, for sure. Well, you mentioned franchising. So Mm -hmm. what was what was your guys's? mindset when you were looking at okay i mean obviously you made the decision that the franchise the franchise route is what you're going to go right you went with first class what were the the factors yeah. that led you to do that with them versus another route and what are like the pros Williams, of going like yeah because mm-hmm. i think a lot of people when they hear franchise they think of i'm getting into something that i don't really know what i'm doing yeah. i'm giving somebody my money hopefully it works mm-hmm. out fill us in on a little bit of that because i'm not really familiar with the franchise yeah i mean franchising it does seem like um something that's like way out of like uh graphs for most people but it's actually really obtainable to buy a franchise you just have to have like the the desire to be in that industry um if you're going to work in the day-to-day some mm-hmm. people buy franchises hire a general manager and they just watch it work cool. right um like i talk to people that open like uh, boot camp gyms and stuff like that and they're like i just want a franchise because they have the branding the logos mm-hmm. the presence in the market and they have the blueprint of how to operate. Yeah. Um, so whenever we're coming out of being individual agents, it's like, I'm not a business owner yet. Like a lot of real estate agents call themselves business owners, but does your business run without you? And most of them would say no. Mm-hmm. And then if they are saying yes, well, does it grow without you? Mm-hmm. And if you can, can't say yes to that, well, then you don't have a business yet. Because the way we, we look at defining a business now is can I sell that to somebody and at what multiplier? Yep. Um, and so who wants to buy a business that doesn't work if you're not there? Correct. Right? So, okay, let's take a step back and let's figure out what do we want to step into? We want to be smarter than, you know, um, like we want to outpace our current situation. So you have to do a little bit of forecasting and like Nostradamus of like, where are we going to be? You know, everybody writes down their goals. But if you look at my five-year goals that I wrote five years ago, it was to sell you know, 200 homes a year mm-hmm. and be a top producing real estate agent in the country, right? Um, but things change. So mm-hmm. we really delve into this book called um, the, the 12 week year. And Is that what you were? Yeah, that's the one Scott Grace was talking about. Mm-hmm. That's the one that they operate Dude, on. Dude, it just, it destroys your beliefs of like goals, of like how big to set goals, how small, but more importantly, how to execute. So you just condense a whole entire year um, into 12 weeks. And then, you know, weeks or months now. And so you just operate at a different capacity. So we'd set our goals. We'd say, okay, if we want to sell 200 homes this, this calendar year, well, we got to do that in 12 weeks. How do you do it? I ain't going out there and doing that on my own. Mm-hmm. I'm going to kill myself. Yeah, so we got to grow. It's just like it's the, it's just what, what it maths out to be. It's, it's almost binary in that. It's like, okay, you'd have to make the move or grow. Um, so when we went to open a franchise, we just said, um, What's the done for you model that fits with how we operate already? 
And if you look at the top 50 brokerages in Kansas City, they're all franchises. Mm -hmm. So just success leaves clues. Like, I don't know, I was a big Tony Robbins follower. He'd preach that. And so, you know, I want to build something that I can sell at a future date. I want to operate in a business. I want it to be a business. And um, I didn't want to have to distract uh, or or pull my focus away from, um, I guess, growing our business or working in it. So it's like on it or in it. You have to like figure out which one you're gonna do and there's only so much time in a day. So franchising was just the easy option for us. Oh, add to that, if we had gone independent, we would have not grown to the level that we had. And I think you can succeed, but if you succeed at the wrong thing, you know, that's Mm -hmm. not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So how much at the beginning Mm -hmm. were you working in the business versus just working on it for six months okay pretty much i mean like you're full-time in something it just depends on what's that something um whenever we first got started changed the name we're okay we're now we're a brokerage i'm a broker we both co-own it but our job was still the same go sell houses because that was a revenue source so we needed to maintain that and then we said okay what's the metric and the the lever we can pull that's going to get us away from that and that's bringing on agents to help us sell houses Mm -hmm. so we just immediately went into recruiting mode. But at the same time, you have to think about the operations as well of the business. And I think this is what a lot of independent brokers, you know, don't, they don't forecast this. Like when, whenever we were having our initial discussions about opening our brokerage, it was all around like, well, we need a place that's like a thousand square feet, big enough for just us. Um, and that's where our mind was at. But I'm more of a visionary type. So I was thinking, I'm like, well, dude, if we just map this out for 12 months and the way our model's set up and how easy it is to recruit agents to it because we offer, I believe, the best service in town, we should be at 100 agents before we know it. Um, So are we going to commit to this 1,000-square-foot building and then not be able to get out of it? So, like, my mind was like, okay, we got to think bigger than we're at now because we're going to be a different version of ourselves in 12 months. So that's where it tied into the 12-week year because it kind of just shakes that up a little bit. So I think, you know, with our our thought pattern in that moment of being agents, we were thinking too small. And I was at least willing to say, like, no, let's think a little bigger and get uncomfortable right now. Um, and I think Ryan would agree that that was the right choice. Now, looking back, would we do things a little bit differently? Of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but you got to kind of just, you know, plant your flag and say, this is what I'm doing. So we stayed in production for about six months, but we aggressively got out of production. And it wasn't fun at first. Like we went from making $100,000 in a month to, you know, barely closing, I think, seven transactions our first quarter when we opened up the brokerage. Gotcha. Barely bringing enough to pay the bills plus our small salary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where people, they don't succeed because they're unwilling to let go of that commission check that they get to keep all of. Well, you got to take a sacrifice. I mean, there's a yeah. sacrifice. There's a period of sacrificing all these things that we want, right? From yeah. a daily, you know, timing standpoint, to get to where you want to live the actual mm-hmm. life of what you're wanting to live and scale at the scale, you know, at the ability that you guys want to scale at. But that's the truth of, of um, being an entrepreneur, like a true business right. owner, is like taking that step back, delayed gratification right. for just a larger gain in the future. Right. And you know, um, when we first started out. Like, okay, we opened up, we had our team, we were doing pretty good, but we never really advocated for ourselves on like the business journal or anything like that with the association, but I guarantee we'd be the top five. That's what we would have been in 2020. Yeah. Um, And then when we opened our brokerage, you know, we just head down, grow it, work it, let's turn it into something. And, you know, you just, you're never really too sure what it'll turn into. Um, But I think you just have to keep that compelling future of Mm -hmm. like, okay, we're just going to push as hard as we can each day and turn in what we know we can make it. The reason I feel like we're so badass is because we don't try to be perfect before we start growing. We grow and then we perfect things along the way where Mm -hmm. one of the best lines I've heard is uh, perfection is the enemy of profit. Mm -hmm. Like if you try to perfect everything before you start growing, you're never going to be, you know, you're never going to grow. Yeah, because you'll never take the jump. I mean, people get so scared of, you know, under like failing, not understanding how to do something, not completely understanding what the next step even is. Mm-hmm. But it's like you just need to take the next step. You just yeah. got to keep on rolling. Yeah. So you know, with uh, transitioning out of production, about six months, we mm-hmm. just so if you're an agent looking to get out of production, maybe you're on a team or something like that, or want to grow into your own brokerage. Two metrics you should rely on and make those your new two focal points is 
how many agents are you hiring on a monthly basis? And then how many deals are you closing on a monthly basis? And those should be growing each month. Um, and you just put your focus on that. So however you want to manipulate the agents in your office or your recruiting strategies outside of the office, like go for it. But those are the two metrics you should be tracking. So when agents come to to your guys' brokerage, what's the setup like for them? What what are the what are the benefits and major pros of them coming and jumping on board with you guys? Um, our growth plan. It's you know other offices they like we're a blend of of like uh, your standard box real estate company and a flat fee company. So you come on board. We have our partner model, and you can pay splits, but you're on it. You're in a team environment, um, so you get least training support. Like mm -hmm. as much support as you can imagine, we have it. So we basically took all the best tips and tricks from our buddies that live on coastal towns that run massive teams. And we said, we like that onboarding process. I like the way you set that up. I like the way you do these calls on a regular basis. I like that. And we just plugged them in. And nobody in Kansas City seems to be doing that. So it's like we're different in that way. Um, and so we provide so much support. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't know, we paid a ton of money in, in third party coaching. I mean, we spend probably 100 grand a year just on coaching alone, traveling to events and stuff like that. And our agents get that same experience because we just take the same things that we're paying for and we provide that to our agents almost at no cost. Yep. And so that's our partner model. And then, you know, if agents, they, you know, kind of figure out the business for themselves, dude, turn yourself into a badass, you know, team agent or just stay independent, like on your own individual and keep 100% commission. Um, so we, we allow agents to maneuver inside of our office and they don't have to go rebrand themselves and go to a different company to keep 100% commission. They just have to well, let us know like they're ready for that. It's almost like flexibility. The Absolutely. flexibility that they have and the opportunities to go whichever route they want to go. Right. It sounds like they have that op opportunity. Yeah. So office. we basically run our brokerage like a team. Okay. Um, and, then, and then we have the ability to have agents just run their own team and they can steal our playbook. So like mm -hmm. we're doing a great job running our team. We have about 80 agents on our partner model. Um, now that's our team. Um, our team agents, so we have, a, there's probably about 60 agents that are entrepreneur agents keeping 100% commission. They can steal our playbook on how to run a team. And now they can grow That's a awesome. team underneath there. So we're yep. just different in that way. Yeah, and we've literally done it. We've taken a brand new agent <clears throat> and we've turned them into two, a top producer. Like, you know, Whitney, for instance, she, uh, she was a photographer. She jumped into real estate. Um, she was an implementer, brand new agent. Her first six months into the business did well over $120,000 in gross commission. Uh, this year, she's probably going to close, I would say, $300,000 in gross commission. That's awesome. And the growth plan is now she wants to start a team. So literally from brand new agent to a top producer, top producer to a team leader. And, you know, she has aspirations of owning a franchise, and we offer that as well. So where she can grow and own her own business. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's all the housing market's down, by the way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's no down market for us. You know, I have this saying I throw around there and it's controversial to some people. They take it personally, but the market's not slow. You're just slow. Mm -hmm. And it's just take accountability of your actions. Like I, I jumped on a podcast this morning. I was listening to it. And this guy's talking about how they were down 80% last year. I'm like, I don't even know what that feels like. We're tripling our business going into this year. Yep. So it's like you're slacking somewhere. And I think it's because you're staying too small. And that's the problem with, you know, small independent brokers and team leaders. They, they want to keep like a tight sealed team of 10 agents. We wanted to do it too. But you just, it's, real estate is what it is. The numbers have always been the same statistics of how the success rate falls. It's always 87% of agents fail out of the business. It's just, it is what it is. And it's not that everybody fails because they suck at real estate. It's just maybe they find a passion in something else. You know, so like Whitney with photography. Well, what if she just hits a hot streak and says, you know what? I did real estate. I'll just do a couple deals. Um, but I want to go full into photography. Like there's plenty of people making those personal decisions to open up other businesses. I mean, we're literally doing that too. Like we're dabbling in other businesses, but we just chose to keep the main thing, the main thing. And you know, some people don't do that. So if you have 10 agents and you know, 87% failed, then you shouldn't be surprised if eight of them leave you. Right. For, yeah. For and, sure. and if those eight, I'm sure some were underperformers because they just, whatever you're offering them, it just doesn't resonate. Just like in school, like, some classes I excelled in, um, usually like art or gym, <laughs> and then other classes I uh, didn't do too well in, which is like math and English. I remember our senior year English teacher, he said, David, how are you failing English? You speak English. <laughs> David, what was the punchline? This uh, was great. It was good. Everybody started laughing. I said, well, that's funny you say that because you're my teacher. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> is this on you? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I kind of pointed it back at him. And yeah. one thing that really got us in growth mode with recruiting agents and, and building out our systems and processes last year was our uh, mentor at the time. He said, hey, if 20% of your agents leave you and you have 10 agents, how much production have you just lost? 20% of your agents leave you and you have 200 agents. How much production have you lost versus mm -hmm. gained? Yeah. So that's, you true, just, that's a good, yeah, numbers. I mean, it's just a numbers game. You got to yeah. look at it that way. And so, you know, it's like uh, taking the emotion out of it and just being very much like um, just processes. Yep. Um, it just, it helps out a lot. And because um, like, you know, we'll talk to people and they'll have 12 agents on their team. And like I fired half of them. They just weren't showing up. They don't have what I have. And I just... I can't, I can't tolerate that. Well, they'll come over to our office and then maybe they'll chill out for three or four months. Like we don't, we don't expect agents to be productive because you can't like, I, I just, it is what it is. It's human nature. People are just going to get in where they feel comfortable. But what we can do is control the environment in which they're productive in. So I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure when you step into my office, you have all the resources you need. And if it's up to you. Do you want to Correct. come in? Do you want to do you want to get on the virtual meetings we have? Do you want to come to the in-person ones? Do you want to be at the office? Do you want to engage? So that's, that's how true. We judge it. I mean, because you, you guys can't. You can you can provide all the opportunities and all this all the skills to be successful, but it's 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 ultimately their job, the right? You, you you can't you can show up every day and not do anything, not make the calls, mm -hmm. not do the trainings, not do all this, and then blame. <laughs> yeah, your, own, your only self is the only one that's the reason why you're not successful with it. So yeah, and so like that agent that comes over to our office from that team, they kicked them off because they only did 12 deals mm -hmm. last year. They'll chill at our office, maybe they'll set for four months, and then they'll bang out six deals in one month. Like you never know. Yeah. So it's just like I always say, the next top producer is a new agent. So just give them time and patience, and let those those seeds sprout. It just depends on when. Some people sprout right away. Mm -hmm. Some people take a little bit. Yeah, well, but, and what gives you guys the ability to have that patience, though? Like, what? Because to me, as I'm hearing it, as I'm listening, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of risk, right, on your end to, to let them blossom and develop and have those resources, right? So, what's the what's the hurt of having someone on your team if they're only doing 12 homes a year? Like, yeah, we we talk to team leaders and broker owners all the time, and this is why franchising makes so much sense. We bring over a brand new agent. If it takes them six months to do a deal, we're only profitable when they come over. We don't lose money by bringing over a brand new agent. Whereas team leads and other broker owners who are independent, they have to pay a cost seat on all this technology. They have to pay a cost seat. They feel like they need a ton of leads and that's their issue. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know that leads aren't your issue. You need to learn the business. You need to be accountable to whatever it is that you're good at and do it on a consistent basis. So we're not we're not leaking money when they come over. Our company and our franchise is set up to be profitable day one. Yes. So we don't have to push them, hey, you're not closing any deals, you go to a different company. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of the other companies, they're leaking money because they have seat costs and that person, if they don't pay their seat costs or whatever, then they're not profitable. And if you're bringing on $1,500 per new agent that you're bringing on, you know, day one, and they don't close a deal for six months. How much are you out? And you, know? you guys are doing the same single, same stuff every single day, no matter if they're there or not. Right. right? Because that's the process yep. and system that you guys have. Exactly. Is hey, this is you're doing the same thing. You're just now getting at a bigger level. Yeah. The more people come on, people um, they give a shit for growing at such a high scale. Like, oh, you don't have. Not all of your agents are producers. Had we not brought all those people in, we wouldn't have had the core group that we have now kicking ass and and. It's a numbers game. If you get 100 people Makes in the sense. door, 20 of them are going to be rock stars. Yeah. Well, let's take it back to a basic level. Like in business, it starts with prospecting. I got to hit 200 dials to have 20 conversations to maybe set 10 appointments. Yep. Right? So if you only set out for that day and say, I'm going to make 10 phone calls, you're probably going to get two answers or probably going to be two bad conversations. And you judge your whole day off of that result. And you judge a whole industry based off of that level of work you're putting in. You're just gonna have a skewed view of what's the reality of the business. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so, like, uh, it, there's this book called Profit First, and we, we lead with that model. So we, we just we structure our business to be profitable because you can never go out of business making a profit. And so as long as every action you do, bring on an agent, there's a revenue source there. Monthly fees we collect, which are very minimal, especially compared to what's offered in the market, very minimal there. We lead with a profit in that. 
and we over exceed expectations with everything we provide too. So that team leader, that's like Ryan said, the example, literally people will be spending $1,000 a month day one on new agents. So you get 10 agents in that are unproductive. That's 10 grand a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, scale. You're hemorrhaging cash at that point on an unproductive agent. And because we are able to scale, because we have everything negotiated on a corporate level for our franchise that we give all of the most like productive agents and non-productive agents the same CRM. Everybody gets KV Core. Everybody gets their brokerman access. Everybody gets a university. Everybody gets access to our calls. And all of those costs are pre-negotiated. So they're at such a minimal amount that we can charge a small monthly fee and it's and we're able to be profitable. We that. ran the numbers. It's twelve hundred dollars for the same technology and services that we use. If you're an independent person, we get mm-hmm. it for fifty bucks per seat. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. So there's that spread there, and that's the power of franchising. We mm-hmm. would we would literally be fighting against our our P and L and our growth aspirations if we were we remained small and didn't choose a franchise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had a conversation with this guy. Um, he moved over to our office. He's an investor. Um, But he said he's in this group of um, like business owners or older scruffy guys that like have ran massive businesses and they have like a little club meetup thing. I don't know, kind of like mentorship deal. Mm -hmm. Um, Very selective on who they let in. But uh, my buddy I was talking to was just in the break room just shooting the shit. Um, The guy comes over and start talking. He's like, oh, what did you do, man? And then the guy that the older dude was like, "Uh, I owned and managed 1,200 subways. That's what I did. 1,200 of them. It's 1200 like subways, 1200 subways, not even 1200 employees. Yeah. 1200 so, like, subways. think about that. Like, what's possible yeah. out there? And would he be able to do that if he just opened up his own sub shop and scaled it? Probably not. That's true. So, you know, you just think about, like, how do you skip steps and what's your real goals in business? Yeah. That's smart. Mm-hmm. So, what does your guys' day to day look like uh, now versus, you know, shit whenever you guys first started? Because I'm very interested to hear that. Oh, yeah. It was crazy. I mean, the, the moment that I think a lot of real estate agents that are listening to this will be able to relate. We were at a party at my house. We had our team going on. Um, we had some listings up. And we were negotiating contracts. So midnight, beer pong, music. So I got my I got my laptop on the computer. I'm going back and forth, and they're shooting beer pong balls over me um, while I'm doing it. And but I was so distracted, mm-hmm. I didn't get to enjoy any of the of the party. I didn't get to hang out or do anything like that. And, you know, the next week we went in the office and we're like, dude, what are we doing? It, like, we're doing, we just did 25 deals this month. Is our goal next month to do 23. 20, 23. Mm-hmm. Okay, is our, is our goal next year to do 46 deals? Like, are we going to double? Mm-hmm. And then double the next month? Like, and then I already can't have enough time to spend with the family or friends or do other things right now. Like, if we double, dude, we might as well just kill ourselves. Like, yep. this is insane. So we were operating at that kind of capacity. Um, and our day was just very much like hardcore, like follow up calls, multiple appointments a day. We have sayings for our agents, never leave today without an appointment tomorrow and never go one place for one thing. Always yep. double up your activities when you go do something. Um, so it's just like those things we, we preach, but we implement it at a high level and it was just exhausting. I mean, you think any transaction you have like five people that you communicate with, mm-hmm. not including clients. And so five times 25, Mm -hmm. like that's a lot of people you have to talk to on a weekly basis, give them updates and status reports on where you're at, deals fall out and headaches happen. So it was very much hectic. Um, We made 100K that month and I said, they could have it. Yeah. I don't want it. It's not worth it. Yeah. Not worth it. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. And so now today, um, we're pretty much leveraged in every area that moves the needle in our business. Like we got recruiting, we have um, our transaction coordination and our back end accounting and all that stuff handled. So, and that's because of all the systems we got when we onboarded with our franchise. And so we just implemented those, put the right people in place. Mm-hmm. So we show up every day and we just look at each department and just see how it's operating, almost like check engine lights. Mm-hmm. Any, anything flashing? No, mm-hmm. all good, cool. What do you need? All right, we're going on with our day. And then we go work on bigger projects. So it frees us up to give back to our agents. Um, to implement different strategies, negotiate like um, some lead opportunities for our agents too, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um, we just work on bigger, higher level projects now. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So, what else do you guys have going on now? You said you're dabbling in other in, in, in other dabbling things. Oh other yeah, businesses. we've got some. We've got some businesses we're opening up. Obviously, Elite Edge Insurance. Mm-hmm. We've just partnered up with you guys early this year. 
Uh, that's been going wonderful. Um, you guys have been great to work with, by the way. Mm-hmm. Anything that you guys say you're gonna do, you do it, and it's like five minutes, so that's really cool. Yep. Had nothing but positive feedback, too, from that. Uh, we just opened up our and launched our mortgage company. Okay. Kind of works hand-in-hand hand with the insurance company, mm-hmm. but I know you guys have already kind of built a little relationship, so we just got that going this week. Mm-hmm. Um, we're coming up with some new systems for the agents to be able to utilize uh, mortgage and have a good experience with that. And then I do jiu-jitsu full-time, so would have never been able to do that uh, in our current structure, nope. our prior structure. Like, sure. like you're, you're a pro now? He, I do I it full time. Basketball like, he just yeah, got his blue belt, so he's basically a pro. 95% of people <laughs> that start won't get a blue belt. So I feel <laughs> what's what's after that? the blue? It's purple, brown, and black. Okay. So uh, me and Ryan started jiu-jitsu last year at the same time. I lasted about two weeks. <laughs> but best believe I bought all the swag. I got all. Yeah, I got two yeah. geese. I'm like, I need one for the morning class and the evening class. Mm-hmm. And I think he paid for like another, yeah. what, year or so? Probably still on their payroll. Probably or, still, yeah, on, still on their subscription. Yeah. I'll just drop in, yeah. you know. Every right. once in a while, check. You'll be in welcomed with open arms, I'm sure. Yeah, why, like what, a chokehold. So why did, you, why did you last and you didn't? What, what's, I don't know. I think, you know, Ryan, he has this thing about him. Whenever he commits to something, he sees it through. Which that's the quality not a lot of people have. Yeah. Like no matter if it sucks, if he sees that there's an overarching benefit to it, he's gonna keep with it. So um, you would, this is all brand new for you, other yeah, than from last year. I thought maybe you had been doing this your entire life, basically. We wrestled in high school. Yeah. Um, like eighth grade to at least for me, I started in eighth grade. I went all the way to senior year. Him as well. But you wrestled youth. Um, and yeah, but then we. I don't think we just Joe Rogan kind of like hearing them always talk yeah. about it. It's always just like, oh, it'd be fun to dabble in a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, my friend opened up a brand new gym and I'm like, I'm in there. And it's funny because he was kind of on that same growth trajectory that we were. He started out in a like 750 square foot spot. Oh, his biz- or his gym? Yeah, his gym. gym. And he, you know, he had to pull out a heat lock on his house, open up this gym, a lot of expenses up, up front. And um, he's grown it since the last year and a half since I started and we just opened up a new spot there's tons of people waiting at the door trying to get in and uh, that's awesome mm-hmm. it's it's just that consistency and marketing and pushing mm-hmm. yourself out my favorite saying with marketing because I see a lot of good business owners who do this it's if you're the best salesperson how many doors can you be in at one time mm-hmm. one if you have marketing everywhere how many doors can you be in at the same time unlimited probably mm-hmm. you know about and, the awareness and so like uh to kind of like justify why i didn't keep doing jujitsu so i read this book called the dip very short book it's nothing too crazy but it talks about this phenomenon where it's like um are you willing to be world class at something and it's like if you're not willing to be world class then you shouldn't pursue it because it's like um you do something long enough, like golf is a good example mm-hmm. for most people. It's like, okay, starting golf, you uh, buy all the clubs, equipment, stuff like that. It's a good point. You, you go for like three weeks mm-hmm. straight, a whole month straight. You don't really get any better, mm-hmm. right? At like, you know, maybe you're decent and then you start hitting the learning curve and you dip. Um, at that bottom of the dip, you need to make a decision. Are you sticking with it or are you giving up on yep. it? Because if you drag it out and just feel obligated to show up every time, but you're not willing to be world class at it, then you should be spending your time doing other things. Yep, you'll just be half ass at whatever else you do. Yeah. So like, I find myself if I get like a weird like you know, hey, I'm not really feeling this, or like I, I am feeling it, but I just don't feel like the passion. Um, then I'll just recognize that hey, that's my dip. I need to make a decision. I'm doing it or I'm not. Um, and so that's something that's helped us out in business too with other things. Mm-hmm. So you know, if you guys are listen to this and struggle with those kind of decision makings listen to that book it's really good that is good that's a good point and, and i want to clarify too world class doesn't mean like you have to be the best in the world um he breaks it down to like your local market too like amongst your peers mm-hmm. start there like are you willing to compete to be like elite amongst your peers in this and then take it out like your region your you know your yep. town and then you can go even further because that's world class in itself you know it's the commitment to it as well mm-hmm. i think like you got to commit to i mean to being the best you can possibly be at whatever that is but if you're not committed to being the best at what you can be then it's no no reason of doing it exactly yeah growing up i remember my dad would never let me quit anything that i started yeah. and i'd at least have to do it for a year and my kids being the same way they my daughter my son started mm-hmm. jiu-jitsu my daughter comes home the other night and it's like I don't like when we have to go live and wrestle live. So 
She's like, I don't want to go back. And I'm like, you're going for at least a year. Correct. And some of those things, even with high school and wrestling and all the other stuff, I would have never met those people, had the great experiences that I had, had I just got out early. And some of the best things I've ever done, it, it took a year to really figure out if I liked it or not. Yep. No, that's a that's a great point. That's a, that's a hell of a it, point. It actually. equates to literally all facets of life, too. Yeah, everything. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's Relationships. Awesome. I mean, oh, yeah, your yeah. marriage, like if you're not committed into your marriage, then it's not going to, like if you have a half ass marriage, it's going to yeah. fail at some point in time. If you half ass commit to your business, it's going to fail at some point. Yeah. If you half ass in the gym, like well, it's, and it's, it's like you and your wife, you had your first fight. What if you guys gave up? Correct. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, ah, you know, it's just not for me. Yeah. Where would you be at today? That's a good, I really, I, what's that book called? Uh, it's called The Dip. The Dip, D-I-P. Sounds like you need to figure out if you want to keep playing golf or not. That's, I mean, no, that's a great point. Because, like, every time I go out and play golf, I, I'm just as bad as I was the last time, if not worse. If you were truly committed, you'd take classes. Correct. You know, you I would change that. I would make the changes to get better. But if mm-hmm. not, I'm like, well... Like what you just said, I don't want to go backwards to change my swing and do all this other stuff. My commitment for golf, because I know I'm not going to be world class mm-hmm. at it. I've taken lessons before, but I don't know. Things that are scheduled, I tend to like try to get away from them. I like to operate like by the beat of my own drum. <laughs> I mean, shaking his head because he knows it. It's okay. <laughs> I just, he, he I moved 10 minutes from the office, and he still shows up at the same time whenever he was 35 minutes away from the office. So. Yeah, I stay consistent. <laughs> he is. I'm never on time for anything. No, and that's know. like that's the reason why you know I, I want to get on the military when I first got out was because of that. But like my um, my philosophy of golf is uh, I accepted the fact that I suck. But I, I understand that I'm decent with a couple clubs. Mm-hmm. So, like, my wedges, I can get a consistent stroke every time. Yep. Driver, I'm not even trying it. If I can just hit, like, you know, whatever iron off of the uh, tee box, mm-hmm. I'll try to do that. And then try keep, to make sure groundskeeper's not looking at me. I just mm-hmm. put a huge divot in the in the tee box. but Because I can hit that way farther than my driver. I top it every time. It's no good. So, I just make my focus when I go on the golf course is I'm bringing drinks gonna have a good time might have some music and we're gonna have fun yep you know and that's it and so i'm like more the shit talker if anything so you know you just gotta know your role like your lane like where you at and i like i choose not to be hyper competitive in those moments because i know i can't compete and i'm not willing to Mm -hmm. in that moment so that's where i think business owners mess up too are people getting into a new business as even if you're um you know a real estate agent or whatever I, I see people expect to be really good up front. It's like, how are you going to be great at something that you've never done? Correct. You ever mm-hmm. picked up the phone and made a great conversation your first time you were on a phone? Probably not. Mm-hmm. When you rode a bike, did you did you just take it up the hill and, and mm-hmm. go on that the first time? Probably not. And it's it's a learning process. With real estate, at least, I say the first year is learning. The second year is earning. Patience. Mm-hmm. I have that conversation with my six-year-old basically every day with whatever sport he's doing um he thinks that he's just going to be awesome at it right away (laughs) and it's it's uh i don't know i mean if you've coached your kids and you know your daughter's in jujitsu and all that stuff you know you know how it is when you're trying to give them instructions they think they're going to be awesome at it right off the bat so this is hard yeah i don't want to do it anymore anymore. that's where you got to persevere push them through or then they accomplish something they think they're awesome at it right away too i'm good i'm the best i'm michael jordan (laughs) yeah yeah i found that like what really gets me going is i love like like spontaneous things <laughs> and i love going after things that are just like almost impossible targets like it has to be like kind of on the borderline of like dude this can't be done mm-hmm. then i'm like yeah i can yep. i don't know that's kind of have my mindset like if you tell me i can i'm gonna tell you i can and so um like like i'll whip up presentations like the day of when i'm presenting five minutes before a presentation in front of 50 60 agents it's five minutes before. Yeah, and it's a great presentation. That's every time. Awesome. Every yeah, time. Yeah, he's. So if you want someone consistently beating the drum, that's not David, mm-hmm. but our business would never be where it is without him. Like franchising. I was like, nah, dude, we're, let's go SEAL team. We're going to have a little team and we're going to do a ton of deals. Mm-hmm. That's what my thing was. Um, you know, some of the other things that he's implemented with processes and procedures, I would have never thought of that shit. So even though the stuff that he does doesn't take him any time, mm-hmm. Like, ha- have we not had that? We'd never be in the position we are now. Yeah. And well, that outdoes me beating the drum every single day. Correct. And that's the power of, of having multiple people in your organization. Right. Because everybody's going to have their different niche. I mean, mm-hmm. that's what we're doing at our office, right? I mean, there's reasons why. Um, 
you know, me and Dusty aren't doing our marketing, right? Like yeah. know your role, right? And flex on what you're really good at, yeah. right? Like be yep. literally the best, like knowing when you come into the office, like there's not anybody that will outsell me in insurance or outright more insurance than me. No one's gonna trust me more than, my, than, than when they trust me, right? Yeah. So knowing that, I feel like that's a huge flex. Oh, and is. that's where you have the quicker you people like people understand that, the faster it is they'll take, you know, it takes. Me and David say that all the time. I'm like, stay out of my lane. We have our lanes and we stay in them and mm-hmm. we don't cross pollinate. Yeah. It, it, it was a process up front because we were literally like that movie Stuck on You. Have you seen that? Two twins. Mm-hmm. They're, yeah. It's a funny show. It's older. It's mm-hmm. really good. But they're like hamburger cooks and they uh, signed up for amateur boxing. And so one guy is boxing two brothers that are conjoined twins, and they beat the shit out of them. Uh, it's funny. Stuck on you. There's a guy in it. Matt Damon's in it. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I know I've heard of it. Yeah. I'm thinking of some, I was thinking of uh, Catch Me If You Can. For some okay. Reason. That, that kept popping yeah. up in my mind. So, um, yeah. That, but, like, that's how a lot of people operate when they have a partner in business. And it's like, okay, you can do that for a season, but after you kind of get in a groove or you're building something, you should try to part ways and – a, a really good book on partnerships is called Rocket Fuel. I don't know the author's name, um, mm-hmm. but we were at this conference in Texas, and these guys are like, holy shit, I just read this book, and I wish I had a partner because you guys are literally these guys. And so it talks about the, the duality between the um, integrator and the visionary, and so what roles they play. And then he, he literally, there's chapters in the book, and Ryan's more the integrator, I'm more the visionary. And so there's... Parts on the book where it talks about the frustration that the integrator experiences with the visionary's thought process and how they want to implement things. Mm-hmm. And it just bashes you for like three chapters. So like Ryan would – he would send me audible clips of like, you motherfucker. Like, yeah, this is you, bitch. Like whatever. Just – and then I'd go to hit the chapter where it talks about the visionary talking shit on the integrator. I'm like, yeah, well, this is you. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then it talks about the strengths. And then you're like, okay, yeah. And you figure out where you fit in. And it's really neat because it talks about Henry Ford. It talks about, you know, Walt, Walt Disney. Disney. All of these different, you know, like uh, massive companies who has a person behind the scenes that nobody knows about. Mm-hmm. And that's usually the integrator. Hmm. Um, and so it's like somebody had to build the freaking factories. Henry Ford wasn't doing that. For sure. You know, something I heard about like just innovators and people like forward thinking as well. Like Henry, if he would have listened to his audience or his customers at the time of, of how they should um, integrate or implement or, or improve their product, everybody unanimously would say we need faster horses, right? But he saw things differently. Yeah. He said, yeah. We need what was he? Go. He put a V8 in a, I don't remember what it was, but they're like, engineers said, it can't be done. It can't be done. And he's mm-hmm. like, you've got this year. I need a way to figure it out. Come back several times. It can't be done. And then one day they, they did it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's something like, you know, if anybody's in a partnership or trying to grow a business and scale and kind of stay in your lane, this helps identify who's who. And if you're both the same people, that's fine. Just figure out different projects to work on. And then if you're visionary only, you're not going to grow a business because you don't have the integrator to actually implement the work. So you got to find a worker. And if you're the the integrator, then you need somebody because you're just going to be grinding. Those are those agents that are doing, you know, 40 to 50 to 100 deals consistently. They love to grind the work, but I just feel like they're on a hamster wheel. There's only a matter of time before the work just exceeds your output potential. Yep. And so you need that person to paint a bigger picture so you have something compelling to build towards. Like That's all a great day. point. <clears throat> That's I can't agree enough with that. Yeah, you guys have a lot of awesome points. Honestly, it makes you know, make, when I'm listening to this, I want to evaluate mm-hmm. even what we're doing, right? Yeah. And and how are the things that you guys are talking about and implementing? An exercise that we use um, is called the T chart. So it's very simple. You just get a sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle, and a line at, line at the top. Did your English teacher teach you that? Uh, no, did not. <laughs> you know, my English teacher taught me to um, to understand what people's my art teacher actually taught. My art that teacher one. did, but my English teacher he he helped me realize that there's certain people in your life that are supposed to serve a purpose, mm-hmm. and if they can't, if they're not serving you, then they're not as useful. But just because they're there doesn't mean, you know, like a lot of people get stuck listening to the same people. Like Ryan said, what is earlier on? What does success look like? Um, and if you're successful at the wrong things, then, you know, what is it really achieving your outcome? Like, oh, I, I work so hard to earn all this money for my family, and you get back to your wife, and, and everything's in shambles. And it's like, well, I didn't want all the money. I wanted your attention. Yeah. But I was successful. Where are you? You know? Yeah. So, yeah, that's what my English teacher taught me. Mm-hmm. It's like, be, be very particular about who your mentors are. But also, my English teacher, we did have a good banter, and he got me out of some stuff. So I also learned that, like, Keep key people like on your good side, no matter if like they're 
judgmental of like how you're performing in their class because I should have gotten in trouble a lot in high school and he bailed me out a few times. Um, yeah. One one funny story that you know still resonates with me today is oh, yeah. uh, David on the ACTs. <laughs> you know what the minimum score is on the ACT? I'm like 13. 13. Yeah. For writing your name, you get a 13. And then they average out the different sections, and that's what you get. David, first time, he got a 15. <laughs> Second time, he's like, no way I got worse than the last time. Mm-hmm. Opens it up, he got a 14. Yeah. And then, <laughs> uh, so he went on to the Air Force, and he, he could pick any job that he wanted to uh what did you get? It was it was something extremely. Uh, I scored thirty or the something. ASVAP? Yeah, I scored super high on the ASVAP. And he went into para rescue. Yeah, they okay. say you can get any job you want, and I want to go special forces. But I think it comes down to like, where do you want to apply yourself? Like, I felt that there was no use for me being at school. I just didn't. I don't know. I just it was there for fun, and I just had a really good time. I was more of like the facilitator of the parties and stuff like mm-hmm. that. But when it came down to doing any work. I don't know. It just wasn't something I was. Really but it wasn't on. that you didn't have a work ethic. I mean, it's, it's yeah. Not, it's not that. It's just like you said, where you're applying. Yourself. I think role models too, because um, me and Ryan, we were trying to duplicate what we were doing in high school. Cause we were having a blast, um, and we said, "Let's go to Northwest University, and uh, we'll be roommates." And so, what do we need? A sixteen to get in, or something? Or an eighteen? An eighteen. An eighteen, and I got a fourteen. Ryan, you you didn't. I got get a sixteen, a yeah. sixteen, and a seventeen and a half, which gave me the eighteen I needed. They rounded them up. So Ryan went to <laughs> <laughs> he went to university, and then uh, my buddy Zach at the time, his dad was uh, a higher ranking enlisted person in the Air Force. Did a really badass job. He did like crypto linguist stuff. So um, and then he helped. Um, drop missiles on targets oh but from like a, an intel standpoint mm-hmm. so he would help identify targets it's a very cool job um, and then he talked to me about this pararescue thing and if you don't know pararescue you can mm-hmm. look it up but they're the guys that go in and save the navy seals when they're pinned down like they're the elite of the elite yeah. I'm like let's fuck around with that so I spent a whole summer training for that I was the number one recruit out of this region for like all of my scores and stuff like that um, and then I did really well in the ASVAP so like when I find something I'm like really excited about I'll push hard for it, um, and then you know just let the chips fall where they may. And so I went in the Air Force instead of high school, instead of college. Ryan lasted a semester. You think? I did a whole year. You did a whole year. Okay. Yep. And then. Um, it's a semester more than I did. Hey. <laughs> yeah. So it's just crazy where like uh, life can take you, because mm-hmm. I'm sure a lot of people they would have scored that low on the if they had low self confidence. I had very high self confidence, so I didn't care if I got a low score. I could kind of just shake it off because I knew that it wasn't important to me. Yep. Um, I'm sure it would have devastated a lot of people. That's one awesome. one cool story when David was doing real estate in Arizona and I was still in Kansas City, uh, we had a conversation on the phone for like four and a half hours or something. I was I remember this. I was pacing back and forth on my house by my house and uh david was like i was like man if we partnered up we'd kill it because i was doing well here by myself but i didn't have the systems processes and stuff and then david uh he finally was like well let me talk to my wife Mm -hmm. and that's how we partnered up and he moved from arizona to here yeah working together now now here we are yeah it was a weird time i was like you know what it does line up to work out that way no so that's awesome how you guys ended up where you're at now yeah. and all that stuff. Well, so I'll just kind of put a, uh, like, summarize our story of how we got together. So when I was in the military, I, I went pararescue, mm-hmm. um, drowned, um, had a really bad experience with underwaters, got pulled out of training. Um, then I got reclassified into a career field called PMO, Precision Measurement um, Laboratory, Equipment okay. Laboratory. Very nerdy. Um, did that for three years, and then I just saw everybody that was in charge of me or like a superior of mine, like they hated where they were at and they wish they did it different. And so I just said, I don't want that to be me ever. I never want to have regret of that. So I just put myself in his shoes, looked back and I said, well, what does he wish he would have done? Um, and I, so I got out and then I pursued real estate investing, just Google, YouTube, mm-hmm. um, bought a course, wholesale the house, got my license, I moved to Arizona. Um, and then got into real estate and I figured out this is a lot easier than I thought. And then um, me and Ryan, uh, we had conversations. I'm like, dude, get out of that job you're in and, and get your real estate license. Like, I'm gonna show you exactly how I'm doing it and you're gonna do it in Kansas City and I guarantee it'll be way more successful than what I'm doing here. And it worked out to be that way. I just had enough foresight to realize like, I had something and I just knew I needed to tell somebody about it to get somebody involved. 
Um, and honestly, I had other people I reached out to as well to get them excited about real estate. Mm-hmm. And Ryan's the only one that took me up on it. Um, and then, you know, he had mentioned just a little bit ago, but we had that three hour long conversation whenever he was in real estate working um, and running himself dry. He's like, man, I can't handle the back end stuff. This is killing me. And, you know, I just see everything as no problem. Like, let's just get after it. Whatever it is, let's evaluate it, make the most logical decision and move forward. Whereas he would get kind of tied up emotionally into these things. And we just found out there's a little bit of harmony there. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, and then Ryan was like, what would it be like if you moved here? And I'm like, I don't know. Let's try it out. So we did that. And then um, I transitioned to Kansas City in 2019. And then we spent 2020 getting after it. Hmm. Sold a bunch of houses and then opened our brokerage. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, hmm. Yeah, you guys have an incredible story. You guys oh, are great. I mean, honestly, good. you're mentors to us, too. I mean, seeing what you guys are doing. Mm-hmm. And um, sure. we're glad you came on. And this is going to have a lot of... No, this will have a lot. Like, I actually it gets me really jacked up listening to all these things because and we don't even have enough time to go into, like, like kind of how we think and mm-hmm. our thoughts. But it, it just it's crazy how it all aligns very similar. Yeah. Um, and who would have freaking thought that it would have happened just off basically a cold message to you guys to say hey like what's up what you guys are doing some yeah. cool things and so are we like let's do something together yeah so we don't really know how we're gonna figure it out but we're gonna figure it out a lead edge to the moon i can't wait to have another conversation at the, end of the, the at the end of the year and uh see where we're all at i'm sure it'll be a completely different spot i know it's gonna really pick up like not to go into details with that but uh right now is an easy or is it not the easy but an easier time to grow a brokerage on the insurance side because rates are just crazy so yeah. we're gonna we got a yep. lot of good stuff coming so yeah. Yeah. anyways it's worked out yeah. well thanks everybody right, for guys. watching 42 episode yep. 42 episode 42 thanks to david and ryan for coming on appreciate and, you having uh, us you guys have been awesome yeah so we'll thanks, see everybody guys. next time cool appreciate right, peace you out. later